Good morning. Um, okay, we'll we'll just get started. So uh, the talks are uh, 35 minutes plus 10 minutes for interactions. The time will be uh, indicated on that uh, little screen. Um, so the first talk uh, today is by uh, Alexei Kachenko uh, from Brookhaven, and he'll be talking about uh, reversal of the second law in uh, in autocatalytic polymer systems. Uh, okay, so first of all, of course, I would love to uh, thank organizers for what promises to be a great program. And what I'm especially impressed so far is, uh, as theorists, is that we have a balance between theory and experiment in the in the program, which is unusual for something run in the center for theoretical studies. So, as you understand, most theorists actually prefer experimentalist talks. Uh, now. Uh, uh, several months ago, when I had to give the, uh, the, the topic of my uh, lecture, I decided not to talk about uh, DNA-based self-assembly, to which lots of my efforts are devoted. And uh, yesterday I realized that it was a smart decision because Ben and, and Dan basically killed the, pro uh, killed the topic. <laughs> so yet another to uh, talk on the same subject probably would be one, one, one talk too much. However, if you still would love to hear something and you are still here on Monday, I will be giving a seminar on that very uh, subject it will be called How to Build a Diamond. And today, indeed, I will be uh, talking about something that is loosely related to Origin of Life. Uh, the talk, uh, the whole talk, talk title didn't fit, so it's called here Onset of Natural Selection and Reversal of Second Law. Uh, you, and you know which second law I'm talking about, right? Uh, I will start in a way which 20 years ago would be a, a huge cliché. I remember I was a postdoc at the times, and not once, not twice, my colleagues in condensed matter would start their talk by uh, referring to uh, this uh, phrase by uh, P.W. Anderson, more is different. And uh, I never got it. I mean, I, it was, okay, fine. People need to, to insert this uh, citation, maybe it's important. Uh, then I eventually, at some point, I read the article of Anderson in Science in 1972. Uh, so this is sort of opinion piece, uh, and uh, this is probably the only article by Anderson which I, I can claim that I understood. Uh, and uh, it reads almost like an apology. Uh, apology for doing something else than fundamental high energy physics, namely condensed matter. And he tries to say something, okay, guys, yes, you do wonderful things. And indeed, you think about the dates, right? In 60 years, from 1905 to be, its middle 60s, it was probably the best times of uh, fundamental physics on record. And will not be repeated, however, it's a safe, safe prediction. Uh, so he started with uh, Newton's mechanics, basically, and they ended up with uh, pr pretty much complete uh, uh, standard model, which means that they developed everything from relativity to, to uh, uh, quantum mechanics to quantum field theory, everything in just 60 years. Uh, so it, it was quite understandable that people who did something less than high, high, uh, than, uh, uh, high energy physics felt a little, little bit inferior back, the, back then. And what, um, what Anderson was trying to say that, wait a moment, fundamental is not only about the rules of the game, so let's take the, well, now I'm sort of improvising, but basically that's what, what he, he was saying. Uh, let, let's take the uh, f standard model. Uh, you can, in principle, explain it to fourth grader. I don't know why they still uh, keep teaching kids at that age, you know, the stupid model of the atom with all this, you know, orbitals shown as, you know, as, as real orbits and things like that. Well, why not to teach them, I mean, the real stuff? Uh, you can do this. Of course, once the rules are set, you have to play the game with this rule. That's when the things become complicated very fast. And then some mysterious thing happened. At some level, 
the things become simple again. So you recover chemistry, right? To make all those atoms, and you know how these atoms interact. So now again, you can start playing game with it. You got chemistry. From then, you got biology, and that's very complicated, right? But then, at some point, right, you you build human, you build human society, you enter uh, uh, the domain of social interaction, and that's something that you, in principle, can explain to a kindergartner, right? Uh, so, um, in and. The most non-trivial part in all this story is, of course, how you go up and down here in this sort of complexity, uh, along this complexity line. How you go from one level of understanding to another level of understanding. And you can notice that in 40, 50 years that passed since uh, uh, this was said, more is different, right? Uh, Progress in fundamental physics was so-so. It was, it was okay, there were some, some discoveries. I can say it was nothing, but uh, progress in everything else, in what uh, Anderson would claim back then was also fundamental, was so much more uh, impressive. So we know now much more about how to go from one level to another, how to interconnect them. But, well, physics this day is that doesn't have particular boundaries, as you know, right? Uh, what used to be just condensed matter physics then became also soft condensed matter physics, then some complexity stuff, etc., uh, etc. Et so basically, you take any any human subject, you apply methods of physics, and it kind of works. Um, however, however, several questions and important questions remain or at least stay at the same almost the same level of understanding that they were and i personally would love to have a satisfactory answer to those questions um so there th here is my list you are welcome to add something but this all uh, dealing with going from one level to another so first question uh, uh, how does thermodynamics emerge from mechanics? Then, how classical domain emerged in quantum theory? Then, how life emerges from non-living matter? And how does conscious emerge? Right. So, all these are probably quite fundamental questions. Now, my definition of satisfactory answer is very simple. It's the answer that I will be satisfied with. And in that sense, the first question I believe is off the table. Uh, I don't have problem with it. The problem, it's mostly people who write statistical mechanical books have problem with it. So, I, I, as we all know from Dan, uh, Dan's talk, probably that's the wrong place to search for wisdom when you're, uh, when you're looking for some truly non-trivial question. But, but the problem is solved. So that's okay. Uh, the last question, yeah. Uh, given the development of artificial intelligence we are experiencing now, I'm afraid we will know the answer earlier than we would like. And uh, we might not like it, so I will not touch it. <laughs> okay. uh, what is remarkable is that all these questions are related to the topic of our conference, to the information and entropy. And in some cases, it's quite obvious, right? Uh, after all, the first question is all about just obtaining second law of thermodynamics from mechanics, from something. So for a while, it was considered to be fundamental law of physics, including by Planck. Uh, and then at some point, we had to conceal and say, yes, it's, it's, it's actually not fundamental. It's emerging uh, uh, law. Um, uh, the last question, again, it's probably have nothing to do with processing of information. Um, now, what about the other two? It's not necessarily trivial to see how they're related to information and entropy, but uh, I will review. So since last couple of uh, months or so, I was very uh, interested in looking at this problem number two. I will tell you a little bit about it. So. Let's let it be entropy, and let I have uh, a, a quantum mechanical system in a pure quantum state. What we know is that its entropy is zero, right? You know, logarithm W where W is one. Uh, its entropy is zero, and it stays zero 
And long as you use your Schrodinger equation or any other description of quantum dynamics. So it's always zero until this interesting moment when you decide to measure your system. So then something mysterious happen, happening. You measure, and what you get after you measure, but before you read out the result of your measurement, so it's already there, it's on your computer or somewhere, but you went home and you didn't read it. So at this point, the entropy is not zero. The entropy is something which is basically minus sum of pi log pi, where p is a probability of a particular outcome. Right? And this, there is nothing quantum anymore here. This is just uh, uh, the moment when you toss a coin, you close the result, and of course you have two possibilities. And uh, at the moment when you open and see the result, then you know which which uh, 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 which outcome you get. At this point, you get back to the state of zero entropy. Right. So this part is trivial. This is just classical uh, uh, observation. Uh, but, of course, what happens here is a big mystery. And in addition, the biggest problem is that, uh, even though in the classical interpretation of, of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, Copenhagen interpretation, you have uh, essentially a classical observer looking at everything, and, uh, and he can live in classical world. In reality, of course, quantum mechanics should describe everything, including the observer. And that is a big mystery. It was partially solved in around 1990s uh, when people realized that if you introduce coupling to, uh, to environment, if you have uh, uh, some part of your system of which you don't care that much, you can basic, basically lose some of information due to this environment, and that will allow you to go here. So, environment helps. Um, what, what I was able to find recently that you can do it in a more elegant way without you know, expanding your system to infinite uh, uh, number of degrees of freedom, but that's a completely different story. So if you want to hear, I'll be happy to tell you. Uh, now, it's time for me to move to the central topic of my talk, and that is life. So let me just formulate what I actually want to do. I want to find the simplest Darwinian system. That is, I want to find a system that will uh, obey physics laws, that, uh, well, obey physics laws, and yet be able to exhibit behavior which I would call Darwinian evolution. And uh, Homer Simpson here doesn't qualify because first, uh, well, he's simple, all right, but he probably doesn't care about physics laws, and uh, I doubt he would survive real evolution. So uh, that's a bad example. The good example is here. So this is called uh, RNA enzyme or ribozyme. Uh, these things basically can do the same thing as proteins, so they can act or act as enzymes, uh, in particular enzymes to building other RNAs. Uh, so they have the secondary structure that has some enzymatic activity. And there are good indications that there was a time when proteins were not around and uh, uh, RNA did all the job. They still do a little bit of job now, but, but it's, of course, the shadows of what you, they used to be. They, we know RNA for different reasons. Um, so, in principle, it is an experimentally realizable system. Well, it's, it's in fact, uh, realized experimentally, uh, where you uh, have a couple of uh, ribosomes that actually build each other. Which is, which is cool. They, they can even exhibit some sort of evolution to oh, some fitness uh, improvement under, under, under stress. Uh, but first of all, it's not particularly simple. So it's, you can estimate the probability of its spontaneous emergence. It's, it's really minuscule. Um, it's rather long. It has hundreds of, well, an of order of hundreds of bases. And each base, of course, is not, is not trivial. Um, then, there is another model system. This is the result of experiments uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Paul Chaikin's group in, in NYU. So what they did, they had this very simple 
uh, concept realized uh, with the help of uh, DNA origami. So they had the sequence of this uh, quasi-polymer -po made of uh, DNA origami units, and there was complementarity rule between the different units. So there were, for example, this red and greens, and, uh, uh, and uh, I guess red was complementary to green, or something like that. So they were able to build the complementary uh, strain out of a template, and in this way, of course, you can exponentially uh, multiply the number of um, uh, the chain of a particular sequence. Of course, this is also very similar to CPR. You, uh, uh, sorry, to PCR, PCR, polymerization chain reaction, which is very common in in biology. Um, this idea, this idea actually comes back again to Anderson. So in this uh, other paper, 1983, which already in the domain of papers of Anderson that I think I understand, <laughs> uh, 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 he actually proposed almost that. So he thought, of course, of DNA, which is not particularly practical, but he thought that if you have a template uh, and this complementarity rule, you can basically template formation of your complementary on the next generation. So, and then, of course, he mapped everything onto, uh, uh, onto some uh, variation of Ising model, but that's beside the point. What we tried to do with my colleague, uh, uh, Sergei Maslov, who is in Urbana Champagne, uh, uh, we tried to put some more physics into this model. So we really wanted to consider uh, a situation when you have uh, real monomers that can uh, form new contacts and which also can uh, uh, obey this complementarity rule. The big uh, disclaimer is that, yes, we are, of course, driven by the analogy with DNA and RNA, but no, you cannot really implement this with real DNA and RNA because some of the reaction we are talking about in, uh, for, for these particular nucleic acids are prohibitively slow. So that's the reason why the life doesn't really easily emerge with, with this unit. Uh, so, what, are, what is our model? In our model, we have this, uh, uh, this uh, set of monomers that, uh, um, that are driven by the change in environment. So you have periodic change, for example, from night to day, uh, or salinity changes or something else, uh, and periodically they hybridize. So if, if there are chains in the, in the solution, they will find their complementary and stick together. And then, uh, once this happens, there is a chance, not particularly high, but chance that two ends of the two chains will find themselves close enough on the on the template, and then there is a chance there is some uh, there is some rate constant that will ligate them, that will actually make it into a longer chain. And then, of course, day comes and everything gets uh, separated except those bonds which were formed and which are not, break not easily breakable. And then we have basically two, uh, one more element, and that's fragmentation. So sometimes those bonds will break. Absolutely equivalent interpretation of this uh, fragmentation can be uh, that you dilute your system. You add water and you add some fresh monomers. Turns out that this is equivalent. Uh, okay, so now imagine that we run this problem starting only with monomers and a little, well, <laughs> addition of, di of dimers. I will need dimers because in my, in my model I never have any reaction that, oops, that occurs without templating. So if there is no dimers, there is basically nowhere to, to have those uh, uh, any, anything going. So I say only monomers and infinitesimal amount of dimers. The first question is, will, will the longer chains appear then? Before answering this question, let us look at this, uh, this problem. Suppose you already have chains. The uh, I didn't specify what what is the length overlap length preferred overlap length that is needed to bring the two chains to the template, right? And uh, you can easily uh, argue that the longer the better, because the longer the overlap, the bigger the energy, the more probability it will be there. That's true. However, you have finite time, 
So if, if you have really long fragment and you're working in, within random sequence approximation that all sequence are equally probable, finding the complementary to, uh, uh, to the chain of length 5 is much easier than finding complementary to chain of length 10. So what happens is, uh, for a small value of this overlap k, of course, you will be just following the probability, probability of hybridization will follow the equilibrium curve, which is exponentially increasing. But then at some point, you become dependent on, on this com uh, combinatorial factor, on, on the just chance of finding your complementary over the time window you are given. So as a result, there is a strong peak at, at finite lengths, which is dependent on that uh, time of the night, that available time to, to search over, uh, over your pool. So, uh, in our model, we basically uh, say that, okay, this K0 will do dominate uh, the whole process. As long as uh, the, ch the overlap is bigger than K0, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's shorter, the probability will be exponentially decreased because of simple energetic consideration. So, then we can uh, argue that if you have two pieces of uh, uh, two chains of lengths L and M, you can ask what is the characteristic time of them to merge together. That characteristic time will not depend on their lengths as long as their length is bigger than that K0, because you only need this K0 to initiate uh, the ligation. So this means that merger rate of these two guys will be independent on lengths and with no solution to this problem. Because if, if I, uh, I basically can map this into equilibrium problem, where any two chains can merge with certain rate, and break at certain point. Uh, I know the result of this uh, uh, pro for this problem. It would be exponentially distributed uh, uh, chain lengths, and now the only missing point is that I have to make the problem self-consistent. I have to say that this merger rate actually proportional to the probability of finding the appropriate template in my pool, which I guess, of course I can calculate once I know the distribution of lengths and assume that all sequences are equally pr uh, probable. So when you do this, the as often is the case when you write some uh, self-consistency equation, you will find a first-order transition. So you uh, above certain threshold, these chains can be able, uh, will be able to leave and reproduce. They are long enough to uh, to to create next generation, but as, when certain parameter becomes smaller, they just disappear. Everything gets extinct. So uh, the parameter here is essentially a concentration, a combination of concentration and square root of two time constant in my problem, which is ligation and, and breakage rate. And this is a result of numerical um, uh, calculation in, uh, in our system. What we found uh, is indeed as a function of this control parameter, which uh, has concentration and lambda and beta, uh, the system either have this long a long exponential tail, or it just consists of pure monomers. This early part is, of course, representative of this K0. So, as I said, uh, this uh, approximation that the merger rate is, is independent on the length of the chains is only working for long enough chains. When they're shorter, the situation is different. Um, now, this is a comparison of analytic and numerical uh, solution, and you can see we, uh, we are quite good here. So we understood qualitatively and, quanti and quantitatively uh, what happens here. So indeed, at some point, when the concentration is above certain threshold, the system will unavoidably go to this, uh, uh, even if you start only with monomers and with little bit, little infinitesimal number of dimers that is sufficient for the system to build these long chains. And it will be self-sustaining. And you can say that, okay, good guys, you just develop a fancy uh, polymerization scheme. And you would be right, of course. The only thing is that our polymerization scheme transfers information. So in principle, the moment when, when uh, uh, this templating occurs, the information of a template is, uh, is being transfer, uh, tr uh, transferred to the next generation. 
except we worked in a random sequence approximation, so basically we only we used this powerful technique to transfer random random noise, and that was annoying. So that's why we moved on and tried to build the model this uh, that would take sequence there. And we realized, okay, you know how uh, sometimes all the models are classified as bottom up or top down. So one of those is those that you start with something simple and then try to make it more complicated to match a real experiment, or you start from the top, trying to describe everything, then try to uh, simplify the model a little bit so that it's, uh, it's uh, doable, let's say, on a computer. Uh, what we uh, did, as my colleague uh, Sergei says, uh, we did bottom-down approach. So we, we took our very simple model, made it even more simple. Um, so this is our simplified model. So in our new model, I will not need a big overlap of the two uh, 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 of the two chains. I will say that just a single monomer is sufficient to keep the uh, the substrate on a template. Uh, when we did this, we effectively said the following. So we know that k0 is the characteristic length that I need. So let us just say that all those k, uh, all these words of the length k0 will be my new monomer. So I renormalize the notion of monomers. When I did so, of course, instead of let's say I had four monomers initially and k0 is 10, uh, I will have 4 to the power 10 uh, different letters. So uh, in this simple model, I actually can write very simple equations that, that uh, drive the dynamics. So once again, so I have these chains. Uh, we choose them to be directed just like DNA and RNA. Uh, you can reformulate this problem where they will not be directed. Uh, it, it, again, we have day-night cycle. During the night, each each letter finds its complement, may find its complement, or it stick there. So, if uh, this means that if I have two letters, for example, A B, they can meet if there is a, a complementary doublet. I call this B star A star. Doublet will be. It's, uh, we try to distinguish it from dimer because they are not individual dimers. They are rather two letters anywhere in the uh, on the chain. So you can calculate the total number of doublets with particular sequence. So, for example, A B doublets in in the volume. That number. The density of doublets is called D here. So you can say, you can write now this equation that uh, the change of number of these doublets is proportional of the number of left and right ends of, uh, of, uh, of the right type and proportional to the, uh, to, uh, to the uh, density of uh, complementary doublet. Right? So that's where this three body term comes from. And then, of course, there is a universal, uh, there is uniform or non-uniform breakage rate. Any, uh, any doublet can break. Uh, good news is that I don't need to write equations for the free ends. So these L's and R's represent concentrations of free ends, and I can always find them just by conservation laws. So if I know my total concentration of, of uh, monomers, if I count all, do uh, all doublets that uh, uh, contain particular uh, monomer, I, I don't don't count them, so everything else should be a terminal of, 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 of this particular type. So this together gives a very compact way of describing the system. So this is a system that contains actually big chains with different sequences, but all I need is to know the statistics of these doublets. So this, uh, this is cool. So we now can run it, and the first thing we did, indeed, this was like the first idea that we had, was to measure information entropy content of this uh, uh, of, of the sequence pool. And we were extremely happy at this point, because what we saw is what I call reversal of second law. Of course, there is nothing uh, fundamentally wrong with second law not being uh, uh, there, because it, this is driven non-equilibrium system. But it is highly non-trivial that second law starts working backward. Right? So we see that the uh, Information entropy, we define it uh, in regular sort of uh, 
uh, Gibson way, uh, uh, DIJ log DIJ or Boltzmann. I, I'm no longer <laughs> sure what whom should I <laughs> uh, uh, give priority here. Uh, so uh, DIJ log DIJ. Uh, now, the, even though it's information entropy, it's also a part of real thermodynamic uh, free energy of of my pool of uh, of um, chain. So as as this thing it decreases, the free energy of the pool of chain, so chemical potential of any monomer there, actually increases uh, uh, accordingly. So what happens? In order to do this, we need to understand what red, this red uh, red curve is, and I will tell you in a moment. So what we did, we looked actually at the concentrations or densities of doublets present. And what we realized, so of course, this is the matrix of all doublets. I have Z uh, monomers, in this case it's 20, so I have 20 by 20 matrix. And turns out that even though initially all of them can be there, right, all 400, eventually what survives is something like 40 or less. And that's, wow, so, right, so you you have real natural selection now what we what was the input of the uh, of the th theory so first of all these coefficients uh, in my model remember there was lambda and beta so beta the breakage rate was just set to one so we say there is a uniform depletion for example going on so it's irrelevant coefficient at this point the uh, it can be renormalized re uh, the time can be renormalized accordingly uh, uh, lambda we said that we don't want lambda to select uh, to be a very important selector of the winner. So we said, let lambda be around certain quantity with infinitesimal variation. Infinitesimal in practice for us was like 1% variation. Uh, and that was enough to destabilize the system and this, uh, uh, to go to this uh, new steady state where only this very small subset of doublets is present. Uh, concentration was, in this particular case, was uh, again initially uh, just infinitesimally variable around certain uh, constant value, but then we realized that it's not a representative uh, uh, example of what, what should be studied. So I'll, I'll tell about this a little bit uh, later. Uh, so let us understand where this uh, phenomena actually uh, uh, coming from. So you can realize that if I have two complementary uh, uh, doublets, you can actually write equations uh, only for two of them, and this will be two, uh, driven by this, you know, uh, determined by this two by two matrix, right? Uh, it is nonlinear equation because right and left uh, uh, concentrations, of course, changes your doublets uh, change, but let's say they change very slowly. So in that case, you can treat this as linear equation, and you know how to treat it. You just calculate the determinant of this equation, and if the determinant is positive, then this doublet will grow. If determinant is negative, it will get extinct. If it is zero, it will stay there. So there will be an actual non-trivial solution uh, uh, for DIJs. Uh, and indeed, you can now calculate how many of these zeros you can have. How many times can you satisfy requirement of the determinant to be equal to zero? How do you do this? You say that the maximum number of this equation should be equal to number of variables. And how many variables I have? You would say it's right and left concentration and the total number of those is 2z, right? Because I have two ends, two ends right and left end, and I have z uh, number of monomers. Uh, now, uh, as you not, might notice here, they always come in a combination right i times left i star, where star stands for complementary. So actual number of, uh, of uh, variables in these particular equations is actually two times smaller, it's z. So that said, the upper bound on the number of, uh, number of uh, uh, doublets uh, uh, that will survive, uh, so it's 2z, not z squared. And that allows, that explains this reduction in entropy. So that red line that you've seen was just logarithm of number of surviving uh, doublets. Now you can describe this also as this De Bruyne graph, where you essentially have uh, the 
uh, arrow of particular thickness proportional to the doublet present uh, going from one, uh, for one, one letter to another. So in principle, the whole pool can be generated as a Markovian walk on this, uh, on this uh, graph. Uh, and uh, uh, what is interesting in this case is that, of course, it eventually the entropy saturates, so it just goes to this minimum and it st stays there. However, if it's just an artifact of the model that we have, in the real world where, for instance, longer correlation might appear, so this work is no longer Markovian, your information entropy would go even more down. Furthermore, you can imagine that the system develops uh, some secondary structures. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm almost finished. So uh, that the uh, RNA will develop, or not RNA, but this uh, these molecules will develop secondary structures which will influence ligation or breakage rate. So there may be some new level uh, uh, of complexity generated, which again might reduce the entropy. The one remarkable and at some point, disappointing result was the following. So if I take particular value of concentrations and particular value of these lambdas, of the uh, ligation rates, this ends up always in the unique steady state. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between concentration input and this uh, uh, pool of uh, uh, chains. So that sort of becomes very... Uh, I even have suspicion, I didn't check yet, that this state is determined by the minimal entropy uh, that satisfies the whole, you know, conservation laws. But maybe not. I mean, don't take this my word. Just one, one, one guess. Uh, however, then I, I looked into this in a more uh, positive way. You can say that now if I have uh, multiple pools, and this is not representative of what, what I actually mean, I mean more like uh, you have um, porous material, and in this porous material you have different realizations with different initial concentrations of the ingredients. In each pore, you will have its your own run of, the, uh, of, your, of this simulation, right? So you will be searching in parallel for something. That, what something, I don't really know. Most likely the secondary structure is somewhat reminiscent of this uh, RNAs. Uh, so in, in, in effect, this opens the possibility of an efficient sampling in a, uh, in a sequence space. Uh, and uh, now, finally, I arrive to the key question. So what actually is life? Uh, so uh, the question was uh, asked and in large degree answered by no one else by Sch but Schrodinger in uh, 1943, so he gave this lecture in Dublin uh, called What is Life, and then published the book on this. And look, look what he says. So first of all, this lecture always is credited as, be, as him uh, foreseeing uh, finding the DNA. So he basically said, uh, let me read it. So chromosome contains some sort of code script that uh, um, the entire pattern of the individual future development and um, it's functioning, yeah, the, 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 sorry, the, yeah, that the basically encodes the uh, individual development. Uh, and he thought of some aperiodic crystal or something of that sort. So he knew that it must be aperiodic. Uh, it was a couple of years before development of theory of information, but he already, of course, uh, got the general understanding that you need uh, some information carrier and the whole purpose of this machine, of uh, what life is, is to steal information from environment, what he call here neg entropy, which is negative entropy. So yes, you of course increase, you have to obey second law at the end. So you have to increase global entropy, but you don't care about global, you care about yourself. So you try to decrease your own entropy. Later he corrected himself by saying that, of course, what I mean is uh, free energy, uh, de in, in increase of free energy, but that's uh, sort of not, not, not as, sound not as cool as, uh, as decrease of entropy. Anyway, so we do have this example of a si simple system that does decrease entropy, and the question is whether it can go on forever, maybe it's through the hierarchy of uh, more organization there. Thank you.
We have time for questions. Uh, you no, know, it's a wonderful talk. I have one, one question at the beginning. You, you were looking at these RNA enzyme, enzymatic system. You say it's very unlikely that they would form. And, and I guess that that's in general true. But uh, one of the possible mechanisms by which you could have an, an accumulation of long chains is something that's being considered by Dieter Brown. I don't know what you... you yes, I know this, of course. You, uh, the, there there is a big reasons. problem. It's just counting problem. When you estimate how many of those are... Uh, ribozymes, and when you realize that you need actually two of them to meet, uh, the naive estimates show you that I mean they just it's mass of uh, uh, of of the planet Earth. <laughs> so so you yeah, say that even if you have an accumulation mechanism, that that yeah, if, if you, you have accumulation large, of long chain, that, that doesn't really guarantee you anything. That's so that's not that's not enough. Yeah, the the, okay. the sequence space is too big. Okay, thank you. Questions. I have a quick question while we wait. So, um, from the first half to the second half, you you went from polymerization to really looking at these sort of dimers or dyads, and that starts to become reminiscent of looking at uh, triads and things like uh, the genetic code, where you see increased probabilities of certain uh, triplets uh, well, yeah. over others. Yeah, in a sense, that's exactly that. It's exactly the genetic code. If you say it's just very primitive, but yes. Uh, the context of this argument, what you're making from quantum mechanics to kind of classical mm -hmm. collapse, uh, is, is, the, is the location of the measure kind of related to the correspondence principle? Because as you keep Correspondence adding, principle was basically, it's, it's just historical artifact, I would say. Uh, it's, uh, it was convenient way of formulating the quantum mechanics at the time when it was formulated. So I, I wouldn't say, it, it shouldn't be taken as something, you know, particularly uh, fundamental. So, for, for example, well, so, some of the things uh, like um, that measurement always results in, uh, in the certain eigenvalue of a certain operator. That is, uh, that is not true. Uh, there are multiple measurements that actually are not like that. There is an interference in terms of the, the, the fact that you, you are uh, interacting with the system. So therefore you will collapse the system, right? Yes. And therefore you would, uh, you would actually have to have a transition from this Q quantum uh, regime to the classical regime. Yeah, but the, the key question there is where classicality comes from, because uh, exactly. you can always look from outside and say, okay, this is all quantum system, and we know the quantum system doesn't. It's almost the same problem as was with uh, second law. So with second law, uh, even at the time when, when there was already uh, uh, Boltzmann's uh, uh, H theorem, uh, someone like Poincaré would say, well, <laughs> I don't care. I know that uh, any function would, uh, would be preserved, so including roll or grow. Uh, so you are, you're, you're making fool of me. So uh, basically the same story here. Uh, we know that entropy right, is actually preserved by the quantum dynamics. Uh, and yet, at some point, we can record, we can, for practical purposes, of course, we have, uh, have observer, etc. So that, that autonomy, this basically obvious conflict, it caused lots of problems in interpretation of quantum mechanics, including the famous uh, Everett multi, multi uh, world interpretation when you actually go all the way to your brain saying, okay, the f and it, it's, it, it actually was foreseen by von Neumann. So von Neumann was the first guy who, who, uh, who was thinking about uh, uh, the measurement process, and he made just one step. So he said, this is my quantum system. I will couple it to apparatus, and then I will do some magic with apparatus. So in, uh, then he realized, okay, of course, here I break the rules of uh, unitarity of quantum mechanics, and then he made this very interesting argument in his book. So that, okay, no matter what you do, so I can make one other step, one other step, but at some point, this photon will come to my uh, eye and and, uh, and uh, it will go to my brain. At that point, I have no choice, but uh, I, anyway, uh, screw quantum mechanics, say there is a classical domain. So he basically gave up at 
that point. So what I'm saying is that you don't need to. I mean, you princip in principle can uh, can uh, uh, live all the way into quantum uh, classical domain, uh, quantum dom uh, in quantum world, and yet interpret what your interpre what your measurement is by throwing away some information. That's key thing. So you just have to uh, leave, uh, uh, decide that some part of your system becomes unavailable for measurement. That's enough to generate classicality. Okay, great. If there are no more questions, let's thank Alex.